Hey, so I'm making this video to talk about Phoenix Live View, which is an exciting new way to build interactive and real-time web applications. It's an Elixir library, so it's not going to be so much of a tutorial about how to use Live View, um, just more of a, a, a walkthrough of some apps that I've made over the past few weeks as I've been learning more and more about it. I've created this um, GitHub repository that has all the demos that I'm going to talk about, as well as a uh, more typed up formal version of what I'm talking about in this video. And so the motivation, at least the way I see it for Phoenix Live View, is that adding JavaScript, adding a front end, a modern front end library or framework like React, Angular, or Vue, um, that adds a lot of complexity to your code base. And it differs based on you know your team or your, the, the use case. But in a lot of cases, um, adding a a UI framework is, you know, it can be overkill. And so Phoenix Live View is an alternate way. It's not here to replace JavaScript. It's just here to give Elixir developers um, an alternate way to create applications that are still very interactive, um, very real time, and still very performant. Um, and you don't have to switch between, you know, front end ecosystem to back end ecosystem. All right, so jumping into the examples, I have six of them here. Um, first one we're going to look at is this simple counter. So this is everything you might expect in a counter application. We've got the value of the counter, a decrement button, increment button, a progress bar. <clears throat> I can't go below zero, so it's disabled, so I'm going to increment. As the bar moves, it's animated or uh, it's using CSS transitions or animations. Um, and then once we reach 10, we can't go past that any longer, so it's disabled. And to, to make this app, all I used was um, Elixir and CSS. There's no JavaScript that I had to write. So how does this example actually work? Um, when a browser sends a request to a route that is running Phoenix Live View, um, the server responds with a normal HTML document just like any other page would. And so the browser gets back uh, this page which has all the content that it needs on it, so it's fully server rendered. And then the next step that it does is it tries to establish a WebSocket connection. If that is successful, the app can now use WebSockets to send messages uh, between the server and the client. And so that's what's powering the interactivity is messages being passed to and from the server. So if I open up the, I'm gonna open up the network tab, and just refresh this real quick. If I find the right, if I find the right one here, messages, here we go. So you can see these are the messages that are being sent as I'm interacting with this application. And so let's look at some of the code for this. Uh, what is it called? Counter, counter live. So it's a, you know, it's a, I've created a module, normal Elixir module. I'm using Phoenix Live View. Um, there's three, so there's three main functions I want to quickly talk about. There's mount, there's render, and then further down here, there is a handle event function. So going from the top, uh, mount is kind of like what it sounds. So one of the, this is one of the first things, one of the first pieces of code that gets run is right here when a request comes in. <clears throat> and so this is, mount is a function where you can set up some initial state and you can assign that to the socket so that it's persisted. The render is where you add your markup for your page. It's also annotated with Elixir code. So I've got my variable count here. And it's no different than if you were writing a normal Phoenix template other than this sigil L. It's for live view specifically. Um, you can have like branching logic here. So this is what I'm using to disable the button. Um, if it if the value is too low or too high, so you, you remembered from the app when I click the button, you know messages are being sent. So how do I set that up? It happens here on this button. I've added an extra attribute called PHX dash click. I've given it a value with change count, and this is this is what tells Live View, hey, when this is clicked, send this change count message. And so that is what this last function that I want to mention here is for handle event. Um, I'm watching for the change count message. I'm grabbing the value from the message as well and then I'm just basically incrementing it and restricting it within the 0 and 10 limit 
and I update the state on the socket. And whenever the socket state is updated, it triggers render again, and so the UI updates. So that's how it works in a nutshell. All right, so jumping to the next example is form validation. Uh, this is a pretty common use case in a lot of applications. So uh, if you have, we have three different fields here, first and last name, they all require different formatting. Uh, James Bond. So that's valid. An email field, uh, Mr. Mutant John Hotmail.com. And um, a date field, for example. Cool. And then the form, the, the button to submit um, enables once all the fields look good. One really cool thing about this example is that the app will work just the same. Well, basically the same if for someone who has not enabled JavaScript in their browser. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to go into my Firefox preferences. I'm going to search for JavaScript. Um, disable. I'm going to refresh this page. So you'll notice I, I got a full page just like you would expect. Um, the validation is, of course, going to work a little bit different because with no JavaScript running, um, of course, you're not going to get the real-time validation. You can still type in the fields and try to submit your data, but then once you submit your data, you're going to you're going to get errors about things that are incorrect. So really, with LiveView, it's really easy to set it up in a way that works best for people, no matter what their browser you know, whether they've disabled JavaScript or not, or whatever their situation is. If we take a peek at the code for this example, um, you can see it's it follows really the same, same thing as the last one. Um, we still have a mount function, we still have a render function. <clears throat> the difference here is that instead of putting my uh, markup right in this live view module, I'm delegating it to a, a view module, um, but it's the same concept. And then we still have we have a new function called handle params, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but we still have handle event functions, and these these are watching for um, any in, any changes to the form field. So whenever the user types, um, depending on which field it is, one of these event handlers is going to fire and update the state. I also want to explain how this app works for people with and without JavaScript enabled in their browser. So going back to the top of the module, um, there's the mount function. And if you look inside here, I've got this JS enabled variable that's being assigned to the socket. And the, the way I'm determining if that's true or false is by this connected function. And what that function is telling me is, um, has a web socket connection been established with the client? And so if you look at this diagram I made, this is what happens when a a browser sends a request to a live view route. Um, the request comes to the server, the mount function is called first, and then the render function is called. At that point, the client gets back a, a full HTML document. And then the next step is the client and the server try to establish a WebSocket connection. It goes through the same process as it did up here. So it calls mount a second time, and it calls render again. And so that's why that's why this function works connected. So this this will be false the first time mount gets called, but the second time um, it will be true. And the only reason I'm using this variable here is to change the the submit button in the UI, because if someone has JavaScript enabled, they should start out with it disabled. If someone does not have JavaScript enabled, they need to be able to click the button, so it needs to be enabled. And so one more thing that needs to be conditional based on if JavaScript is enabled or not is what actually happens when the user clicks this button to submit the form. If JavaScript is enabled, the live view process is going to handle, um, handle the form submission. And it does that like normal with the handle event function. Um, it's watching for the submit message, and it has the name, the email, and the date uh, field values. And as long as it's valid, it's going to redirect to a thanks page. And so it was a successful form submission in that case. And so if the user doesn't have JavaScript enabled, that means we can still handle the form just using um, the traditional form action parameter. And so 
this when the form is submitted this route will get called it leads to this controller here um, I have the name the email the date again and I can validate that um, if it is correct I render the thanks page otherwise I redirect back to the live view and I send in the current values for the name email and the date and that's where that's where this handle param function comes into play it gets called when there's a name an email and a date parameters in the URL and it can assign that back to the socket Okay, I'm gonna go through the rest of these examples pretty fast uh, because I don't want this video to go very long what you've seen so far is really it's the same for the rest of the apps just they're a little more uh, there's a little more to them so this next one is a Kanban task board similar to something like Asana where you can drag and drag and drop cards around you can create new ones um, you can delete them stuff like that this is actually an example where I did have to um, add a little bit of JavaScript and the reason for that is so that I could add drag and drop event listeners um, and Phoenix Live View provides a very small lightweight API called hooks that lets you um, hook into the lifecycle methods on the client side and be able to add things like event listeners if you need to I'm not going to show the code for that just because it's, it's pretty straightforward and you can check out the documentation on, on the LiveView website. Next up we have a typing test application. You can find out what your words per minute is. Um, the results are displayed in real time and it actually shows you other people's results as well as they complete the test in real time. So let's take a look at that real quick. Um, I've got two windows open here to demonstrate how it works. So I'll begin typing here. I may edit this out to be faster. You can see as I'm typing, uh, the WPM is being updated and there's like a clock running. And then down at the bottom, my results, looks like I got 44 words per minute. And then it's just, you noticed it displayed in both browser windows here. So this says it's me. Over here it says it was a competitor. And you know the same thing would happen if I started the test here. And so the next example is a tennis scorekeeping app. So this is basically a way to set up like fake tennis matches and then people can subscribe and unsubscribe to watch uh, the matches as they progress. And so this has two windows here that are involved. So on the left, the green one, this is someone someone's dashboard so they can view all the live matches that are currently going on. Uh, over here is an admin panel where you can create these matches. So I'm going to do Nadal, Djokovic, and create the match. You can see the, the browsers are updated in real time. Um, and the user can subscribe to these different matches. I'm going to create one more, um, like uh, Federer versus Nishi Kori. And I'm going to subscribe to this one. So you can see as I as I give players points, um, the dashboard is updated. And um, I can also just choose to unsubscribe at any time and it doesn't affect these other games that are still happening. And so just to be clear, uh, Phoenix Live View is mostly, it's really just concerned with one WebSocket connection with one browser at a time. So um, the feature that you see here and in the last demo for the typing test, um, that was achieved by adding some of the other features that the Phoenix Web Framework has to offer, like channels or Phoenix channels, uh, PubSub, and that's what gives it um, even more um, real-timeness and interactivity. So they, Live View fits in really well with the existing libraries and things that are common in the Elixir and Phoenix ecosystem. All right, so this last example is a color sorting animation, and it's really more of an example of what you probably shouldn't do with Phoenix Live View, although it's still really impressive how well uh, this performs. So what it's doing, um, I'm going to create about a thousand divs on a page. They're randomly positioned and they have, you know, just random colors. 
and then I'm going to uh, slowly group them based on their hue. So this is what it looks like. You can see it happened, you know, fairly smoothly. So how is this example working? Uh, basically, once the live view process uh, first starts, it kicks off a timer after one second, and the timer will run until every single bubble is in its correct location, and then every 16 milliseconds, um, an update happens. And so, what I'm updating is, you know, each dot's position on the screen based on their top and left HTML attribute, because these dots are positioned absolutely. Um, so every 16 milliseconds, information about every single dot is being transmitted, you know, along the wire. And so for that reason, it's really not a great use case for Live View. I think this sort of thing is really probably better suited for JavaScript in the browser. Live View does have a way of optimizing uh, what kind of updates happen. That's in the documentation as well. It, I don't think it really works for this case, at least not what I was able to tell. But if you wanted to do um, endless, like an endless scrolling list or something like that, you can basically just append the new things to the new items um, to the end of what you already have and not have to send the entire uh, payload of data every time. So those are all the examples I made. If you would like more info or more details about these examples or about Live View, you can check out my GitHub repository. I've got them all in there. Um, along with a lot more documentation about how it works and each individual um, app. Overall, I really like, I really enjoyed using Live View. I've used Elixir and Phoenix kind of in the past. This was my first time doing Live View, and I found it to be like a really fun and enjoyable way to create web apps. And I was impressed how simple it was to get started. So, yeah, if you want more info, go check this repository out.